This morning we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Now last time we ended with a few observations about verse 12, and today we'll cover that some more, and then we'll continue forward in the chapter. And I'm reading from the New King James Version, of the Gospel of John, chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Now these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I've been saying from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of his father, of the father. We concluded there at verse 27. As a reminder here, the Feast of Tabernacles had just ended the day before. Uh, Jesus had gone very early in the morning to the temple and was teaching the people. The Jewish leaders there that weren't very godly had planned to trap Jesus and they interrupted his teaching. They were asking him to pass judgment on a woman, but not the man that had been caught in a very act of adultery. Now Jesus did not condone her sin, but he did not condemn her to death either. Instead, he offered forgiveness and he commanded her to continue her life without sinning. The forgiven woman had gone out. The scribes and Pharisees likely saw her walk out alive and happy, and they were alive, but they were not happy (laughs) at that happening. They went back in and began listening to Jesus teach once again. That's where we hit verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus had likely been teaching about the light of God versus the darkness of the world when he was interrupted by the scribes and Pharisees. And the timing, I think, was perfect. This woman was walking in darkness. She was brought before Jesus as a guilty person. Yet she met him. He spoke light into her life giving her the power to stop walking in that darkness. The people saw his teaching come alive in front of them, and many believed in him. Now, this connection between the teaching and the actions here, I think, was more than just uh, uh, what the surface reading here reveals. Uh, In fact, there are a lot of layers of meaning and truth here, so I'm going to start peeling them back a little bit. Now, the first and most wonderful thing for us, as we see here, is And also the most disturbing for Jesus' enemies was that Jesus here was openly claiming to be God. Not only by what he said, but also by how he said it. This is the second of the major I am statements that we see Jesus making in the book of John. 
I am being the name of God given by God to Moses back at the burning bush. Now, by the way, did you realize that in Hebrew, they don't say, I am, I am hungry. They say, I hungry or I hunger. They don't say, the city is large. They say, that city large. <laughs> They'll say, I was hungry or I will be hungry, but not I am hungry. You know why? They don't use is or am in Hebrew. And the reason why is because in the Hebrew language, the language of the Bible, the Old, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, the present tense of the verb to be is reserved to be used by God alone. Only God can say, I am. And what we see here, once again, Jesus is saying that here. Now, what other impact did Jesus' statement have other than the fact that he's saying he's God? Well, during the feast that just ended, the Feast of Tabernacles, there were a lot of symbols. We talked about the water being poured out on the altars last week and, and the celebra celebrations. And there were also celebrations that involved a lot of light. Um, one of the major celebrations was the illumination of the temple. And it was a joyous celebration, a lot of fun. Uh, even the most conservative and devout men of God would go around, they'd hold up lights and lamps, and they'd be dancing and singing into the night, sometimes all night long. There was so much bright light there during the night that the light penetrated, it was said the light penetrated every courtyard in, there in Jerusalem. So why was this such a big deal for, for the Jewish people here? Well, this light had at least two spiritual meanings to them. The first, it symbolized to them the light of all lights, uh, what we um, know now of, what we hear about the Shekinah glory or the very presence of God. You know, God is light and him there is no darkness. This is the light that we see and we read about in Exodus 13, 21. It says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. And the pillar of fire, just a large amount of light. That's how they describe the pillar of fire. Now, this is the same light that was so intense that just when Moses looked upon the back of God and came back to the people off of the mount where he received the commandments, we, receive, we read in Exodus 34, 29, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. It was so bright that he actually had to cover his face up. That was from the light of the presence and the glory of God. This also filled Solomon's temple when it was completed. And the Ark of the Covenant was brought in and, and its home was made there. Now numerous times this light that is the glory of God, the presence of God, is mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures. And that leads us up to the second major region, reason that this light was a huge part of the celebration. We've read before in Isaiah chapter 9, and in verse 2 it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Okay, yes, they were actually celebrating the coming of the Messiah. And a few verses later, Isaiah 9, 6, we read, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that same light of the presence of the glory of God was present even when the birth of Jesus was announced. We read in Luke 2, 9, And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. So just imagine you're in this crowd, you just had the, the Feast of Tabernacles, you just had the celebration of the light going on for seven days, and they, they've been there for this week-long celebration, and now the one that they were celebrating tied it all together for them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I mean, this was an awesome time and place to be. And as I've caught myself saying a lot lately in these studies, but wait, there's more. In classic Jewish thought, not only was the Shekinah glory present in the tabernacle or the temple, but 
in the Talmud, that's the Jewish teacher's interpretations of the Torah, um, it was also said that this glory was present in other situations. And here are some of the ones that are supported by the text of the Hebrew Scriptures. It was said when people study the Torah, the, book, the books of Moses, the Shekinah is among them. Now, still today, I think that's true. I believe when a person reads the Bible, whether it's in a, a written form, whether it's printed out on a page, whether it's in an electronic form on your phone, I think, believe when God, I mean, when a person reads the Bible, God is the, and the Holy Spirit is present, speaking through the words there. Now, it's also said that when ten are gathered for prayer, this was from the Talmud, when ten are gathered for prayer, the Shekinah rests. Now, Jesus clarified that in Matthew 18, verses 19 to 20, that ten wasn't necessary. He said, Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. See how this all ties together? Now, they, it was also said that when three people sat together as judges, as the law required, a, a court had to have three judges back then, or when a man is sick, or when the Jews were exiled, the glory went with them. Now, I found one other time that the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah light, is reported to be present. And this was when a man and a woman are faithfully married. It was said that the divine present rests between them as they have their relations together. If they throw off that faithfulness, the fire of the Shekinah glory does not provide light, but instead the fire consumes them and is deadly to them. It's an interesting way that this is put. This was in the, in the Talmud. And following the episode of forgiveness for the woman who had thrown that faithfulness off of her married, that's what really stuck out to me about Jesus saying, at that point, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He had not condemned this woman to death. But this holy fire, the presence of God in Jesus, did not consume her, but rather he granted her the light of life, eternal life, as will anyone who, for, who walks following him. I thought that was so incredible. They shall not walk in darkness. No wonder the writer says later in John, uh, 1 John 1, 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. You know, when Jesus forgives you, in God's sight, it's a complete wiping away of any wrongdoing. When I'm justified by faith in Jesus, it really does mean that God looks at me just as, just as if I'd never wronged him, just as if I'd never sinned at all. That's like how I remember justified means just as if I'd never sinned. And that forgiveness doesn't just cancel the penalty, the punishment for sin, it cancels the sin out. The Shekinah glory would once again shine between this once sinful woman and her husband. And only God can do that. And he does do that. And he wants to do that in our lives, in our relationships, uh, in anything that's been damaged by the sin that we've done, uh, maybe among others or in our, you know, to, to other people. He wants us also to let others know that he wants to do that for them and in other people's lives. Psalm 103, verse 12 tells us, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What a great picture. When God forgives us, he will never connect us with our sins again. The east is that way. The west is that way. They're not going to meet. Go around the planet. I can stand on the other side of the earth. And I can do the same thing. East is that way, west is that way. They're, they never connect each other. So it's amazing. You know, just as God is, is literally dead serious about wickedness and how wrong sin is, he's just as serious about forgiving us and forgetting our sins. And yes, this is despite the fact that he does know how terrible our sin really is. In uh, chapter 31 of Jeremiah, we read in verses 31 to 34, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, 
my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now, I think that is so cool because, you know, I have a feeling this woman that had been forgiven, this was not the last time we see the forgiven woman talking. Uh, I don't think this is the last time she talked with Jesus. I feel she may have become an avid follower of Jesus, being so very grateful for this forgiveness. And if she had later come to Jesus and said, Lord, remember when I committed that horrible sin and the leaders brought me before you? And he'd say, nope, I don't. And she'd say, of course you remember. That's when I first met you. They quoted Moses' law and, and asked, what, what would you say? You don't remember, you don't remember that, that, do you? He'd say, I remember the accusers, but not your sin. I have forgiven you, and I have absolutely no recollection of that. That's awesome. That's what we're talking about here. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness can never put out that light. When you're forgiven, you're changed for eternity. What better news is there than this? Let's share it with as many people as we can. And there's so much more in that scripture. We've talked about God's light before, especially in the beginning of the book of John. We'll talk about more aspects of it uh, further as we go down the road. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really quite illuminating to the nature of God. Okay, it's a little pun, but it still works. <laughs> so let's see what happens next. In verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. I mean, this wonderful truth that we just learned. And they're like, you're not telling the truth. The Pharisees just couldn't see it. They couldn't see his light. But it wasn't because the light of Jesus failed to shine, but it was because they were blind. The Pharisees couldn't prove that Jesus wasn't the Messiah that he claimed to be, so they wanted to change the argument. They wanted to say that Jesus couldn't prove himself to be the Messiah. He, didn't have, he did not have the witnesses to prove that claim. They hoped to show that he was an unreliable and untrustworthy witness. But verse 14, Jesus came right back to him. Verse 14, Jesus answered and said to him, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Jesus agreed that a man, a man's testimony regarding himself could not be established as true as we studied, studied a few chapters back. Nevertheless, Jesus pointed out that he was qualified to give testimony about himself because he, and not they, had a view of eternity, where he came from, from eternity past, where he's going to, eternity future. Jesus can also testify about himself because he, and not they, judged righteously. As we've discussed before in the previous chapter, and Jesus added in verse 15, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. See, they had, these religious leaders there, they had set themselves up as judges, and in their fleshly view, they contended that Jesus, they were saying Jesus was born in Galilee, so he couldn't be the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. But they were wrong. Jesus also countered that he could testify about himself because his, his testimony was fully supported by God the Father. And in verse 16 we read, And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. Our Lord here is speaking exactly like an ambassador would. An ambassador does not bring a second person to the table with him to vouch for, for his truth and for his representation of the, the king. His credentials from the king ascertain his character. He completely represents the king to the ones he is sent to speak with. So our Lord alone represents Father God as bearing witness to him. Now back in chapter 5, Jesus had actually shown the same people that there were at least five witnesses of him, including two different and independently verified ways that God the Father had testified specifically of Jesus. But this day, 
There were a lot of people. There were probably still thousands of people there at the temple. They were being taught. They were needing to hear more of his teaching. He didn't go into all those details again. He knew who was questioning him as well, and he wanted to make sure that everyone else there knew that he was well within the law, the Jewish law of evidence. And so he continued in verse 17 and 18. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So if the Jews were demanding that two witnesses be there to satisfy the Jewish laws of evidence, they were there. They existed. They are Jesus and his Father, God. So what did they do? They came back to the first part of verse 19. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? I think it was a little snide there. Here the opponents of Christ, knowing that he spoke of God, they thought they'd throw in, they'd, be, they'd present some scandalous innuendo about him and, and probably wanted to see him squirm. Where is your father? They were obviously here at this point questioning the legitimacy of the virgin birth, ignoring the many supernatural signs that had surrounded his birth. Um, and these signs were not mysterious. They were not secret. They were well known throughout all of Jerusalem and had been for decades by this time. And I've, I've actually searched, I went through, spent a lot of time looking for historical records where anyone else was questioning the virgin birth of Jesus. Now, I didn't find anything for at least 150 years after Jesus left the earth, after Christ's ascension, except for these passages where the Jewish leaders were implying that. Now, why? weren't people disputing this. Well, first, there's Mary. She was there. I mean, she could tell people. Um, she told people the truth. Then her contemporaries that were eyewitnesses to Mary's integrity, they knew her well enough. They knew how good she was. They knew she would not persist in lying about Jesus' conception all the way through her entire life. And we're not sure how long Mary lived, but then there were also younger people who heard the story, they went to Mary, probably even as an older lady, you know, hey, tell me about what happened. And she would tell them, they said, is that really true? And she would assure them that yes, it was true. And all the wonderful things about Jesus were really true. And, and then they lived a long time after, Jesus, after, after Mary's death. So after all of them had died out, over 150 years later, finally there was a writer that questioned the virgin birth. And it was a Greek philosopher whose name we don't even need to mention because he wasn't worth mentioning. <laughs> but the only reason we know, we don't even have any of his writings, but we do know um, a couple of things about him. He was a Greek philosopher, and he pretty much attacked everything that Christians believed in. He, he misunderstood and hated Christianity, attacked what they believed in. And we wouldn't have heard about him except he was mentioned a hundred years after that by a Christian apologist who was countering some false beliefs. And he just happened to mention this particular person had said that there was not a virgin birth and that you know, he made up some stories about him and he said, that's not true. We know from the witnesses that we had back in the first century that this was a true thing. So I found it amazing through history, we're almost 20 centuries later and now in the last 100 years or so, the enemy has filled the hearts of many people and many church leaders. That's, that mystifies me. Many people in many churches deny the miraculous birth of Jesus. But it's no surprise because what are we in now? I believe we're in the last days. 2 Timothy 3.1 tells us, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Verse 5 describes men as having a form of godliness but denying its power. From such people, turn away. And in verse 7, saying, They always are learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It sounds like the leaders, the religious leaders in Jesus' day as well. And it sounds like some of those that are coming back today in these last days. Anyway, the Pharisees in our text were really fighting a losing battle. Um, continuing reading in verse 19, um, Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. 
Now, there's not a punchline here, but I have to laugh just a little bit here. You know, Jesus was, was so cool <laughs> because, you know, we, we, we're going to see the, the discussion heating up a little bit uh, next time, we, in, in the next teaching. But here, Jesus instantly turned the tables around on them with some wit and some charm. The Pharisees had intended to get Jesus all riled up, implying he was an illegitimate earthly child, but they knew that he was really speaking the, of God being his father. And then, boom, he hit these people. These men who had taken so much pride that they knew God. So he called their bluff. Jesus made it clear that they didn't even know his father. They're saying, where is your father? <laughs> and so Jesus is like, oh, you don't even know him. You don't even know God. That is God the Father. I think Jesus meant this as kind of a very respectful slap in the face of these men <laughs> when he said that. So to, to anyone who really studies and, and understands the Hebrew Scriptures, the true identity of Jesus becomes crystal clear. There's no doubts. There's no questions. You know, he was God. He was the Son of God. He was divine. And when they acted dumb to him and said, where is your father? Jesus took that opening to respond, y'all don't have a clue. And the way he did it, uh, I, I don't think there was any response that could have made um, them even be able to save face. They, they didn't, couldn't say anything. And I do want to point out something. Jesus was not being mean here. I want to point out that Jesus knew that these people were not asking honest questions. They were not open to the truth. Otherwise, he would have at least tried to teach them. So, and we read what happened in verse 20. Um, it said, These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. See, this all was happening in a very most open public area where everyone saw and heard everything. And even though the leaders had been plotting to kill Jesus and wanted to take him down, it wasn't yet God's timing. So it said, no one laid hands on him. And in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. Now, we see it over and over, but once again, the Jewish leaders here were gaslighting. He'd spoken of these things before. He'll, he's going to speak of them again. And this was really just an insult to him. When they said, will he kill himself? See, the Jews of Jesus' day taught that the lowest level of Hades was reserved for those who took their own life, for those who killed themselves. And so they're twisting Jesus' words to imply that he's going to kill himself and he's going to go to the worst part of hell, where surely they couldn't go because they were so righteous. And in reality, the opposite was true. And Jesus quickly explains in verse 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. A lot of powerful implications in this verse. When Jesus says something once, and it's recorded in scripture, we know it's very, very important. But when he says something over and over and over again, it's incredibly important beyond what we can comprehend. And you may not have even caught this. Some of you did, I think. Well, let me read what he said three times here. I am from above. I am not of this world. I am he. I am. Yes, I looked it up. Yes, this is a phrase that no Jew would use. Okay? The phrase was reserved only for the name of God. Three times in this explanation, Jesus clearly tells them that he is God. And that's why there's such a contrast in their final outcomes. He is God. They refuse to believe in him. They cannot fellowship together with him forever in paradise when they reject him. Period. But then after that, look at what they ask next. Verse 25. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. Now, as we alluded to earlier, some questions are asked to help find the truth, but some are used to resist coming 
to know the truth, the full knowledge of the truth. Now look at the questions that were asked here in this chapter by these people that were against Jesus. First one, Moses commanded that such should be stoned, but what do you say? Trying to trap Jesus. Then, where is your father? Implying that Jesus had illegitimate birth. And will he kill himself? Again, implying that Jesus would have the most severe punishment possible. Then, who are you? Or who are you anyway? When he had clearly told them. See, Jesus had no new answers, and he told them that. He was also saying that that's why they would die in their sins, because they will not believe. They refused to believe. And he expressed, again, his dependence on God the Father for all that he speaks. Then I think we read a very sad verse, in verse 27. It says, they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. And the reason I think this is so sad is because they simply misunderstanding is not why there was a disagreement here. This was not unintentional ignorance. This was a purposeful, stubborn refusal to see the truth. And as Jesus said in John 7, 17, only those who want to do the will of God can truly understand his words. And it means simply that a person's attitude is more powerful in their mind and in their lives than the evidence of the truth that they see. The Pharisees did not want to know Jesus. And that's why they could not understand his message. As we wrap up today and finish up, I have a simple question for you. Do you want to do the will of God? Or do you want to seek your own way? One leads to life everlasting, the other to destruction. So choose wisely. If you need forgiveness today for walking your own path, for walking your own selfish ways, Take a moment and ask God to forgive you. He's more than willing to accept you where you're at, to teach you his ways. Believe in Jesus. He died on the cross so you could ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he will. And he will give you the power to live right, the right way every day. And we all need him in our lives, don't we? As I close, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you for being with us today.